Starry, starry night Paint your palette blue and gray Look out on a summer's day well, now scientists are also beginning to tap into some of the knowledge of Aboriginal people and how for thousands and thousands of years they used stars to travel and know when food supplies were ready. Robert Fuller is a casual academic with the Noora Gili Indigenous Studies Unit at the University of New South Wales and he's been involved in the research that's underway. Good morning to you, Robert. Good morning, Kelly. Sounds like we might be related. <laughs> Maybe somewhere down the line. Well, as you can tell, I didn't come from here. No, well, my dad came from Belfast, so who, oh, okay. who knows? Who yeah. knows, hey? Now, how did you become involved in this research, and, and where did it all start? Well, I was uh, way back. Um, I was an undergraduate anthropology student in the United States and then went on to a non-academic career and came to Australia in the process and uh, later picked up an interest in astronomy. And uh, when I retired, um, some uh, cultural astronomers, who are people who study the astronomy of people either ancient times or, or current times, um, convinced me to do a master's at Macquarie University at the Department of Indigenous Studies. And out of that came a project uh, looking at the astronomy of the Camilleroy and Uwalia peoples, who, of course, you know or up in that area of the northwest from Hunter Valley up through Kaduga and over into uh, southern Queensland. So what stories did you start to hear about how important the night sky was to the, the people and their understanding of the land? Yeah, well, just to get a little background, you know, first of all, I had to look for the, uh, you know, information that was in the, that had been written down before by early travellers and, and, um, and explorers up in that area and people who talked to Aboriginal people. And after that, I made contact with the uh, with some of the communities up there. And eventually, uh, um, Greg Griffiths from Gunnada, who's a Kamedoi man, uh, put me in contact with a larger grouping of the community, uh, of the community. And uh, out of that came eight people who were willing to sit down and share their stories of the sky that they had from their Kamedoi and Uwalia cultural backgrounds. Uh, one of those people was Michael Anderson from Kaduga, who is a, uh, um, a culture man who can track his knowledge back four generations as well. Yeah. So out of that came a lot of interesting information, some of which had, had not been actually written down before. And uh, just to give you some ideas on that, um, on what we found, uh, one of the interesting things was a more detailed understanding of the of the emu in the sky. Now, a lot of people, particularly country people, know about the emu, which is the uh, is the dark spaces in the Milky Way from the Southern Cross down through Scorpio, and a lot of uh, of uh, Aboriginal language groups in Australia recognize the emu in the sky. But the Camilleroi and the Uwalia have very special knowledge of this, and they used it particularly in in telling them when they should be for example, looking to collect uh, emu eggs because the appearance of the emu in the sky varied over the year. And they also used the uh, the position of the emu in the sky, we believe, to help them lay out their initiation grounds, the, the borer grounds, of which there's quite a few of them were up in the northwest there. Wow, wow. And what stories have you heard about, I guess, then, you know, the time frames around the, the collection of emu eggs or, or, or why it was so important? Yeah, well, of course, the emu for plains people like that was quite important as a resource. And uh, they uh, first, you could first see the emu as the Milky Way rises in, in about May. And uh, the Camilla Roy and Uale saw the the emu was running. They could sort of, they, in the sky, they could see its legs. And then uh, a little bit later, around June and July, the, the emu appeared to be s sitting down with its legs underneath it. And they knew that was when they were actually breeding, so they could collect uh, some of the eggs. And then later on, the emu looked a bit more different in, in August, and they said that's the time when we should stop collecting because the chicks are forming. So, so they they used the the emu as a as a basically a guide to what they could do with the the emu. 
Wow. We're talking to Robert Fuller and he's uh, working on uh, some research that I guess points to what um, what's up here is is down there. <laughs> what's up there, you know, the, 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 the crossover there. That's a fascinating yeah, that's, transition. That's really important, that, too. Uh, that was another thing that came out of the research was that uh, that the Kamaruwa and Uwale peoples, who are basically a, a very close culture group as well, uh, they saw that... Uh, you know, because the Milky Way, or or the Warren Bowl, as they called it, uh, was so important in their culture, and that everybody came from there originally. Everything on Earth came from there originally, and uh, for that reason, there's a lot of links between the the Milky Way and things on the ground. Uh, one example is uh, Weir Wilbur, which is the Willy Willy spirit, and of course that's where the name Willy Willy came from too. And that's the willy willies that we see in the summertime out in that country when the when the dust devils come around, and that they actually come down in, in early summer, or the spirit comes down in early summer from dark places in Scorpius, the constellation, and those dark spaces are reflected in some particular patches of ground that are in the general Walgett uh, vicinity, but quite far out. And uh, those are called bullies, which is also the name for the dark patches in the sky. Have you been on the ground out there? Yes, I have. And uh, it's quite interesting. If you look at Google Maps, at one of the places that's been identified to me as a bully, bully uh, you can actually see that that's a depression. And it's, it looks sort of like a dark depression in the ground. And uh, it's interesting. It may have been an old lake bed or something like that, but it's definitely different in the surrounding landscape. And you, you mentioned um, that they w- you would use the star maps to teach people how to travel around the, the country. How, how differently has it have, have Aboriginal people interpreted the stars in that way? Well, we don't know yet, you know, how many Aboriginal language groups around the country use this technique, but we certainly identified that the Uwali and probably the, the Kamilaroi did. And what they did with the stars was not to use them as a direct navigation device, you know, like traveling by the stars, because Aboriginal people in general tell me that they didn't like to travel at night. So what they did, they used the stars or patterns of stars to teach people how to travel through their country in the summertime. So they would often do this in in the late winter, August or September, when they're still in their winter camps. And they would, somebody who knew this would sit down and teach other people how to travel. So maybe they were planning on a trip up to, say, Carnarvon Gorge that next summer to a ceremony. And there was a particular pattern of stars that would teach them basically how to make that travel. And it would be through each star would be considered a waypoint, a little bit like what we use GPS for. And each of these waypoints could be something on the ground, like a bend in the river or a marked tree or something like that. So the story was was given to the person who was going to travel. And because this is an oral culture, they had to memorize it. So this was really a memory aid, because by the time they did travel, these stars weren't even visible. Wow. So these are just that's just like three examples of what you've come across so far. How how I mean how common would it have been then for so many other parts of life to have been um, in some way connected to the the night sky? Well, the night sky was a very important part of uh, as as my group down at Nurgilly and other places are finding out. The night sky is very important in most indigenous cultures, both Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, and. Um, it was basically, you know, we we often say, you know, indigenous people have been in this country for, you know, 50, 60,000 years. What did they do at night? They didn't have TV. So basically they'd sit there and people would tell stories about the sky and the sky was very important to the culture. And study the sky. How amazing. Robert Fuller's with us on ABC New England Northwest and he's um, uh, doing some research through the University of New South Wales and their Indigenous Studies unit at the, at the the into the night sky and its connection to country and Aboriginal people. And and so how extensively have you been working with Aboriginal communities in the northwestern uh, part of the, the state, Robert? <coughs> Sorry, my... Uh... My project at Macquarie University um, basically took three years. So out of that three years, I was up and down 
to places like Gunnedown, Lightning Ridge, and Gaduga quite a bit over a couple of years, seeing people. And at the end of the project, one of the important things that, that came out of this project was uh, a plan to give back the knowledge to the communities up there as well, which is something that's just started recently. Uh, we've actually got a grant and uh, we had a professional filmmaker make a documentary about the knowledge. And uh, Michael Anderson and Ray Norris, who is a radio astronomer with CSIRO, actually uh, talk in this particular uh, documentary about uh, Western astronomy and uh, and indigenous astronomy. So that should be out sometime in the next six months, I suppose, where people can see that. And we've also done a school uh, study package, too, and we're trialing that right now up at uh, Colorado Bry and Lightning Ridge and, and Gaduga Central Schools. Oh, wow, that's great. Do, do you think it'll come further further east with some of your work? Uh, we, we hope so. In fact, my future work, I'm actually going to start a PhD, hopefully, at... Uh, at New South Wales, so my future work would, may cover some coastal communities from up in Queensland all the way down into uh, south of New South Wales. And the idea there is to look at, you know, getting similar knowledge, but then trying to connect the knowledge through um, connected stories. And we, we think a lot of these stories basically form song lines and dreaming tracks, and there may be one big dreaming track running up and down the east coast so wow. who knows wow so how do you go about uncovering that i mean how, how much is left to find do you think oh it's an enormous amount wow i mean my little group at uh, new south wales is about eight or nine people and i think we're about 75 percent of the people who do this sort of work in australia and you know given there was 250 language groups or more at uh, at the time of um, european arrival in Australia, then there's a lot of work to be done. Mm. And from from your engagement so far, are the Aboriginal communities, uh, do they still have their own stories or is this now quite a bit of research in trying to, you know, go back through any written documents or any old stories to try and find them? Well, the written are they... documents are, are useful, of mm. course, and, and of course there's a lot of language groups that really don't <clears throat> have much of a cultural identity anymore. But there's a lot of language groups like the Camilleroy and the Uwalia who have a lot of knowledge about their own culture. And they're only just starting to share it with people now because they see there's some sympathy, uh, sympathetic uh, re- reception to this information now. When I speak publicly about this, I, I sense there's a very strong interest in the public about this kind of knowledge. And uh, I think... Uh, Indigenous people in Australia will be more open in the future as these type of projects happen and they see that the, the information is being used for education and uh, cultural pride and, and understanding by, by non-Indigenous people as well. Yeah. I mean, are you finding that a lot of the stories are sacred and, and can't be shared? Well, there's a lot that, that I, I don't know and I, I never will know because I'm not initiated. So when we when we study this information. We're only looking at the surface knowledge, what what some of my people I work with uh, call public information. Um, beyond that, there's a whole number of layers of, of cultural knowledge, which, which is sacred and is limited to people who are only allowed to, to know that information. So that information hopefully will continue to be to be known in the communities, but it won't be available openly, though. Mm. And and with respect, I, I ask this, Robert. You know, should Aboriginal people be doing this research themselves, and not well, a, not academics that are removed from the culture? Yeah, what's interesting is is that uh, that academic Indigenous people are starting to do this research. I mean, I'm in a department in a university which has got uh, over 400 Indigenous students. Now, a lot of them are doing science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, but some are, are starting to work into this area as well. And uh, um, one of the things we're trying to do, I think, in giving back this knowledge is also encouraging kids to go on to university. And um, some may come back and work in this field. Others may may work in, in other fields. But uh, it's basically all part of the whole concept of, 
of encouraging Indigenous kids to go on to tertiary education. Yeah. Oh, it just sounds so fascinating, Robert. I mean, really, so what should we look out for in the night sky to, to see the emu? Well, if you want to look sometime between May and, uh, uh, say, October. And, of course, everybody knows where the Milky Way, and you can see it a lot better out there in the country than, than we can here in Sydney. And what you want to do is you want to look at the Southern Cross, and just below the Southern Cross, you'll see a dark patch if your eyes, you know, what your eyes are used to it. And think of that as the head of the emu. And then you look down the Milky Way, and don't look at the bright stars. Try to look at the dark spaces in between. And as you look down, you'll, you'll see a neck, and then it gets wider. And that's the dark patches in the area, what we call Scorpius, the scorpion. And that's the body of the emu. And depending on which, uh, you know, language group you come from, you might see the legs further down or you might see them underneath the emu. But once you see it, you can't forget it. It's almost one of those sort of things like an optical illusion where you can't see the picture, but suddenly you see it and then you can't forget it. <laughs> I can't wait to have a go at looking for that tonight, Robert. Thank you so yeah. much for your time this morning. It's been really, really great to hear from you. Thank you. We'll look forward to maybe following your work into the future, if that's okay. Thank you very much, Kelly. And uh, you can look up, uh, you know, what's happening in this field right now. There's a there's a Facebook page called uh, Australian Indigenous Astronomy. Oh, great. And uh, there's also a Twitter, uh, at Aboriginal Astro. I'll be on to that. Can we put a link on our Facebook page as well? Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Yeah, that would be great. great. And there's also a blog, a blog spot as well, Aboriginal Astronomy blog spot. Dot com dot au. And all this has got recent information about projects that are going on or things that are happening. Great. Good on you, Robert. Thank you for your time today. Thanks very much, Kelly.